This is a continuation of my interview with Cara Santamaria, a science correspondent for National Geographic, an LA area Emmy award winning reporter for SoCal Connected, and the host of the Talk Nerdy podcast. She's the co host of The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, a former host on The Young Turks and on the show Techno by Al Jazeera America. She's made appearances on The Rubin Report, BBC America, Tabletop with Will Wheaton, Star Talk by Neil deGrasse Tyson, Wired, and many, many other shows, including most recently the Netflix original Bill Nye Saves the World. And she's going to talk with us today about her transition from Mormonism to atheism and her journey as a science communicator. Hey guys, Cara Santa Maria here, and you're watching Holy Kool Aid. When I was younger, I was a young earth creationist. One of the first steps to shattering that delusion was I found a podcast called You Are Not So Smart by David McCraney, and I started studying neuroscience as a hobby, including cognitive biases and self-delusion and how easily our brains are tricked. But by the time you started studying neuroscience, you were already an atheist, right? I was, yeah. I actually found atheism before I found science, which I'm not sure is quite the typical path for a lot of people. But I came out as atheist when I was about 15 years old. I was raised Mormon. So I was also I wasn't a young earth creationist, but I was definitely Mormonism's weird because it's not like pure evangelical, but it, it does have a lot of evangelical kind of foci. My dad actually and my stepmother was a biology teacher. My dad wasn't, but he was an engineer. And so they have like a weird relationship with evolution. Like they believe in it, but they don't believe it's the cause of speciation, which is kind of bullshit because that's the whole point of evolution. So like micro versus macro. Yeah, it's really weird. And so I didn't really grow up with a distaste of science coming from my religion. My religion as a child was actually quite promoting of science and education. That said, there was just a lot of arbitrary stuff in the Mormon faith that didn't sit well with me and didn't really sit well with logic and reason. And so I think because that was such an oppressive force in my life, going to church every Sunday for three hours, every Wednesday night for two or three hours, every day before school for an hour, going to seminary, family home evening on Monday nights, just a massive time suck and a massive part of my life and really feeling like it was a lie and realizing quickly that it wasn't just that maybe the Mormon route wasn't right for me, but I actually didn't believe in God or anything supernatural. I think it was a more obvious realization for me when I was a teenager. And it took then several years before I actually found science and a joy in the scientific method. Did you face any repercussions for leaving the Mormon church? So when I told my dad that I didn't believe and that I didn't want to attend anymore because I really felt like I was living a lie, he basically told me that he had a moral obligation to God to have me go to church until I was 18, so long as I lived under his roof. And he and my mother had joint custody at the time, and I only really went to my father's house on weekends. In a way, I felt kind of like he put an unfair choice on my shoulders. And I was 15. I was precocious. I was definitely capable of going in front of a custody hearing and speaking to the judge and saying, you know, I choose to live full time with my mother. It didn't come to that. He allowed me to make that choice myself, but it was either continue to stay at my father's home on the weekends and continue to kind of go through these motions that were really starting to eat away at me emotionally and psychologically, or leave the confines of my dad's house and go out on my own and only live with my mom full time. And so I chose that. I think the timing was right as well, because I did start college when I was 16. And so that was only one year where I lived with my mom full time. And then I actually moved out of her house as well and lived with roommates in a home that was nearby to the university. But he did, yeah, didn't pay child support after that. And we had a pretty strained relationship for several years. Yeah, I can empathize with that. My family do missions work, so I'm a bit of a black sheep as an atheist and science educator. But I'm happy to say that we have a really good relationship now. I mean, as good as one can hope for when we have two diametrically opposed worldviews. Are you familiar with the works of Peter Diamandis? I am, yeah. And his position that this is a world of abundance and the future is brighter than it seems. Absolutely. I take it from watching your work that that's kind of your position as well, but do you ever feel like we're fighting a tsunami with a spoon? <laughs> I do, you know. Especially with the science denialism of the Trump administration and everything that's been happening lately. Absolutely. And I think that one thing that we can kind of remember to maintain perspective is that I think part of the reason that it feels so heavy on our hearts right now and that every day is just such an exhausting day when you are trying to keep up with the news cycle 
that, yes, this hurricane of chaos is swirling around us and we don't have very good tools to fight against it. I think the reason that it often feels like that is because we've made so much progress. It's hard to empathize with the past because we didn't really live in the past except for our short lifespan. But things are so much better than they've ever been throughout all of human history. We do have so many more opportunities in front of us. We are living such comfortable lives. Our lifespans are longer. The incredible technology that we have at our fingertips, the incredible biomedical progress that we've made to help improve our health and wellness and improve the length of our life, improve infant mortality, all of those things are better than they've really ever been. And I think because we are lucky enough to live a life of such comfort and abundance, when regressive activities are happening around us, they're that much more obvious. And yes, this is a momentary experience in our life where things aren't good, where the powers that be, at least here in America, do have a much more regressive worldview and who are trying to undo a lot of the progress that we've been slowly but steadily making. But sometimes that's really how things are, right? I know the phrase is two steps forward, three steps back, but I think it's much more three steps forward, one step back. I do think that our trajectory is a very positive one. And I think that at any given point in history, if you take a step back and you really maintain perspective, you'll realize that you are happy to live in the era you live in. And it would not have been very fun to live even a generation or two or three previously. But that said, it's hard for us to look at the forest for the trees sometimes. And when the trees are literally on fire, it can be difficult to maintain that perspective. It's like looking at the stock market. It's going to have ups and downs, but as a whole over time, it always tends to rise. Absolutely. And I don't look, you know, I have like self-employed pension investments now. I used to have IRA investment. I think I still have some, but I mostly put my money in my SEP now. But yeah, I maintain my own retirement funds because I'm a freelancer. And so I don't have access to a 401k. And, you know, I work with a financial planner to invest in the places where I like to invest. I love index funds. I like to invest safely in the market. But that said, I don't look at it day to day. I don't even look at it month to month. Like I might look at my portfolio once every six months because I want to look at big trends. I do not want to be obsessing over the day to day. There are ups and downs always. But if I'm trending in the right direction and I'm pulling in about 9% on average a year, maybe 10% on average a year, I'm feeling good about my ability to plan for the future. And I think that, yeah, that same sort of metaphor can be applied to generational change. It's just hard for us to think in terms of larger than a life span. You know, we evolve the ability to look at timescales that are on the day to day or hour to hour level. And just we're not good at scale. We're not good at risk. We're not good at perspective. And so sometimes we have to force ourselves into that kind of a worldview. It's like that scene from Cosmos where they compare the age of the earth to a calendar year and human civilization has only existed for like the last second of the last day. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's also like powers of 10. If you've ever seen that like kind of experimental video where it goes to the very, very small to the very, very large. And we really operate somewhere right in the middle where people look like people. Once we get down to cells and atoms and subatomic particles, and once we get up to stars and galaxies and and whole universes, it's very hard for us to contemplate those kinds of scales. Yeah, it's what Richard Dawkins refers to as middle world. Yeah, that's where we that's where we exist and that's where we're quite comfortable. What do you think is the most misunderstood thing about science? Yeah, I mean, I probably have a similar answer to other people, but I think that the most misunderstood thing about science is that science is a process. It takes a lot. It actually kind of takes immersing yourself in a sort of pro-science group or being in academia or listening to science-focused podcasts or hanging out with scientifically-minded people before you really start to understand that science is truly a method. It's not a dogma and it's not a rule book. It's not a guidebook. It's not a textbook. It's not just a library full of information. Science is a living, breathing kind of organism. Science is done by people. People have faults, right? right? And we make mistakes and we can only make judgments based on incomplete information. And then we get new information, we develop new tools, we develop new instruments, and we can take in a little bit more of the 
the universe around us and it expands our worldview and then we can make new inferences and new judgments based on that and it's constantly evolving it's also in a way kind of self-correcting not that science itself corrects itself but there's so many people involved in the scientific process always checking and balancing one another that in a way science works like the best laid governmental system in that nobody's going to be able to get away with fraudulent activity nobody's going to be able to get away with judgments about the universe that are not in step with reality for very long because there's constantly people checking and rechecking everyone's work well and the tools keep improving absolutely yeah we we improve our ability to understand the world but at the same time the charlatans and the shortcutters and the individuals who want to push a hypothesis that's not really based on good evidence are going to be exposed and their work is going to fall by the wayside And so I think that's really something that's fundamentally important to understand about science. It's a process. It's not this dogmatic, dust-collecting, historical thing. How can people learn to be more scientifically skeptical? Yeah, it's a tough one because I think it depends on who is people. We as a nation need to do a better job of imbuing young people with that kind of a worldview. We need to be raising our children to ask questions and we need to be working with our children to seek answers to those questions in an active way. I think that the educational system absolutely has room for improvement. A lot of that comes from the fact that at the governmental level, we're not prioritizing education and putting the money into education like we need to. So I think from a very, very young age, we could make some changes. Beyond that, societally, culturally, we need to be working towards having a worldview that is progressive, that is open-minded, that's curious, that is interested in finding the wonder of the unknown and seeking out answers to questions that we don't know. Unfortunately, our worldview and our societal kind of zeitgeist is in many ways shaped by our political structure. And even though democracy is, I think, one of the best governmental structures we could possibly have. In many ways, it allows for a lot of scientific advancements. In other ways, it causes us to be quite short-sighted. Because the greatest thing that ever existed, which is term limits, keeps our individuals who are in power only in power for a limited time. It also, in many ways, prevents these individuals from being able to make decisions about the future in a meaningful way, because they're always fighting for that next election. And they're always fighting for maintaining their power and their status today. So we're locked into this worldview of the here and now. And I think that that does really trickle down into the overall zeitgeist. I think that the idea of changing one's mind and improving one's outlook is actually denigrated oftentimes societally simply because it doesn't align with a political view of progress. Many politicians don't like to admit that when they were wrong because it can actually negatively impact their ability to be reelected. If we could really start to change this fundamental, emotional, experiential outlook on the world, that progress is something to be proud of, that not knowing is actually not a bad thing, that being open to discovering new things is something that we should be promoting within our society, I think that we would start to see those changes. And so how do we do it? It's tough. I think it happens at the individual level all the way up to the the kind of civic level at every stage in between. It's about voting for the people that you know are going to carry those interests um, to heart and really deliver on them. It's about ensuring that within your family unit, you create a safe space for questioning and for curiosity and for wonder and awe. And it's about continuing to read books. It's about continuing to listen to podcasts and to watch programming that inspires in you uh, a scientific curiosity. And where can people go to find your work? Pretty much everything that I do is available at my website, carasantamaria.com. There you'll find my podcast, Talk Nerdy. I also link out there to 
the podcast that I'm one of the co-hosts of, The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. I'm currently a correspondent on Bill Nye Saves the World, so you can find that on Netflix. I've just started as a correspondent on a new National Geographic. Well, it's not really new. It's a long-standing National Geographic show, Explorer, but those episodes probably won't be out for quite some time. Just keep up to date on my website, and also I'm, I'm really active on Twitter, at Cara Santa Maria. A little less active, but still active on Facebook at facebook.com slash science Kara and also on Instagram at Kara underscore Santa underscore Maria. Kara Santa Maria, thank you for inspiring others to dare to be curious and to not drink the Kool-Aid. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. 